Let's go to Psalm 144. Psalm 144. Psalm 144, and let's read the first eight verses as we launch into this today. We're closing in on the end of Psalms, and just a few more weeks will be done, Lord willing. Uh, I'm not sure where we'll go after that, or what we'll begin studying, but that's all right. Uh, God will lead us to the right subject map in the right book. Uh, the first eight verses here in Psalm 144. Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? Man is like to vanity, his days are as a shadow that passeth away. Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. <coughs> Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, and destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me, and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children, whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. This psalm describes the tribulation in verses 1 through 8. And then the millennium, verses 9 through 15, which we'll get to eventually, uh, some of the modern day commentaries seem to have no idea that those are the right applications of Psalm 144. Liberty University's commentary says of verse 5, Thou thy heavens, O Lord, and come down, that it was a reference to the incarnation, the first coming of Jesus Christ, Luke chapters 1 and 2 etc. Um, but let's read verses 1 and 2 again. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord my strength which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. If you can keep a finger here, go back to Psalm 18 and also to 1 Samuel 22. Psalm 18 and 1 Samuel 22. I'll give you a moment to go to those two places. I, 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 I'm, I made a mistake. 2 Samuel chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18. Uh, Psalm 18. Verse 2 says, The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. Notice there also verse 34 in Psalm 18. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of, a bow of steel is broken by my arms. And um, keep your finger in Psalm 18, and go back to 2 Samuel 22, 2 Samuel 22, verse 3, the God of my rock, in him will I trust, he is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior, thou savest me from violence. And also verse 35 there, he teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Verses 5, 6, and 7 in our, keep your fingers there, verses 5, 6, and 7 in our text say, Bow thy heavens, O Lord, and come down. Touch the mountains, and they shall smoke. Cast forth lightning, and scatter them. Shoot out thine arrows, and destroy them. Send thine hand from above. Rid me, and deliver me out of great waters from the hand of strange children. Notice uh, back in 2 Samuel 22, Verses 15 to 17. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, the foundations of the world were discovered. 
At the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. And then uh, back to Psalm 18, once again. Psalm 18 and verse 9 says, He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was under his feet. Verse 11, He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. And then verses 13 and 14, The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the highest gave his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them, and he shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Psalm 18 is essentially a repeat of 2 Samuel chapter 22. A few words uh, uh, differ between the two of those chapters. Here in our text, Psalm 144, David quotes from his own words uh, nearly verbatim. How could anyone, whether they're saved or lost, whether they're a believer or a non-believer, read all of that without seeing God himself coming to earth in rage and in wrath and power and delivering Israel uh, by wiping out her enemies? I don't know how you could mistake any of that for the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a babe in a manger and so on. Uh, let me ask, who are the people that will be subdued under the psalmist, as verse 2 has it, who subdueth my people under me? <clears throat> well, for this answer, let's go to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, and we'll read the first six verses. Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 6. Who is this that cometh from Edom, with dyed garments from Bozrah, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength? As a question, here's the answer. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel and thy garments, like him that treadeth in the winepress? Those two other questions. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger, and make them drunk in my fury, and I will bring down their strength to the earth. <clears throat> Those who will be subdued, or brought uh, into subjection, uh, will be both Israel and anyone else who survives the tribulation and goes into the kingdom. And it says there, verse 7, for the great waters... Let's go back to Psalm 124. Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick, when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Uh, Daniel 9.26 says, The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and under the end of the war desolations are determined. I think we talked before about the Jews fleeing into the wilderness, and the rock city of Selah Petra um, in the southern half of the desert of Israel, and a man of sin 
being able to cause a, or bring about a flash <coughs> flood to overwhelm them. As incredible as that seems, uh, but he'll have the power of Satan behind him. And, uh, and yet God delivers them. And of course the Psalms uh, talk about God's deliverance when uh, no, else, no one else could deliver them. As Psalm 124 says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And back to Psalm 144. Verse 7 again. Send thine hand from above, rid me, and deliver me out of great waters, from the hand of strange children. Well, who are the strange children? Uh, those are going to be defined back in over in Isaiah 57. You want to run over there? Isaiah 57. And uh, the first four verses... Say, the righteous perisheth, and no man layeth it to heart. And merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. He shall enter into peace, they shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his uprightness. But draw near hither, ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore, against whom do ye sport yourselves, against whom make you wide mouth, on draw out and draw out the tongue. Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? <clears throat> the strange children are going to be those who follow after the great whore of Babylon and after the man of sin and the Antichrist. That should be plain enough when you're considering the Jew in his time of his worst persecution, his worst time of trouble. Look at verse 8 in our text. <clears throat> Whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Turn back, if you will, to Psalm 17. Psalm 17 and uh, verse 7. Show thy marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Psalm 18 and verse 35. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy right hand hath holden me up, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Psalm 20 and verse 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Psalm 21, and verse 8. Thine hand shall find out all thine enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. The right hand of God the Father is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's through Christ and by him that God exacts judgment in the world <clears throat> and bless the world uh, through Calvary and will uh, then judge the world one day through Christ seated upon a throne of glory. But the right hand of God the Father is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the right hand of the wicked in the tribulation, whose mouth speaketh vanity, as verse 8 has it, will be Satan. Psalm 109, in verses 5 and 6, tell us, And they have rewarded me evil for good, and hatred for my love. Set thou a wicked man over him, and let Satan stand at his right hand. So their right hand will be Satan, or the man of sin, Satan in human form, if you prefer. But they'll, they'll be more a practical application, but they will be identified by the mark in their own right hands. <clears throat> Revelation 13, verse 16, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a, a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. That's the false prophet uh, serving the Antichrist. <clears throat> His right hand will be the man of sin himself. That's something else that 
that doesn't get emphasized enough or preached, if at all. Even among um, modern-day fundamentalists who, who have the gospel right, and they have eternal security right, they have a number of things right, but when it comes to digging into the Bible and actually expounding something they read on the page and, and the conclusion they, yet you would have to come to, everyone can appreciate the Lord Jesus Christ being God manifest in the flesh, God in human form, living among men and walking among men. <clears throat> but Genesis 3.15 says, God told Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Well, everyone points to her seed as a great picture and anticipation of the virgin birth of Christ one day, the seed of the woman. But they somehow miss that first part, the Satan is going to have a seed. And the man of sin will be the devil in human form. Can I explain how his conception will take place? No. But that doesn't dis dis dissuade me from believing it, nonetheless. Because that's the conclusion you have to come to. That he will be the devil in human form. And um, so they'll have the mark of the devil on their right hand or their forehead. And, and as Psalm 21, verse, uh, was it verse 8 said, Thy right hand shall find out all, the, all thy enemies. Christ will come back and he'll say, Let me see your hands. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. That's the person who will be accounted worthy to survive into the millennium, who had not taken the mark of the beast. Even if he wasn't a believer in Christ, he knew something was wrong about that. He protects the Jew in his time of persecution, you know, you got people all over this country and probably around the world, they call them preppers, whether they're of modest incomes or wealthy incomes. People with the wealthier incomes, they are, they are, the, they are the ultimate doomsday prep people. They've got more money to spend on high dollar bunkers, underground bunkers and places they can live once the world economy collapses and everything's a chaos, chaotic on the surface. They've got more than enough supplies already stocked for themselves <clears throat> to, to ride it out until it all is over. For years, if necessary. We're watching something, there's a, I forget which state it's in, it's a former uh, missile silo, a nuclear missile silo that some wealthy guy bought, and he converted it into a, a, a like about a 15, 20 story apartments underground. And they've got of course, the things are built to withstand nuclear blasts to begin with. And, uh, I mean, these, they've got gymnasiums, underground uh, uh, gardening, gardens, where they're just fed with, uh, with artificial lights. They can grow crops underground. And if you're claustrophobic, they've got uh, video screens that can portray the outside world or your camera. You can see what's happening on the surface. Or you can select any background from any part of the world you want. It looks like you're in a tropics, you know, when you're uh, 100 feet under the surface of the earth. And uh, they've got more than enough food stock for many years. They've got libraries, they've got schools, uh, set up for schools and instruction of children. And if you've got the money for a million dollars, you can buy, or maybe it's more than a million, you can buy uh, access and reserve a space in that guy's bunker for yourself. And uh, armed Armed guards, a standing guard, make sure only the members are allowed in when the time comes, etc. And these people are preparing for doomsday. They don't know why, but they look at the out. They look at the trends taking place in the world, and they say this can't go on forever. I mean, Brother Ever and I have talked about these things. Carl and I have talked about these things. The economies of the world are just held together by magic. Our our money used to be based on actual uh, precious metals, gold and then silver certificate. Now it's called a Federal Reserve note. It's not based on any precious metals. So one dollar is only worth, has a buying power because the government says it has buying power. It's not valued against any actual <coughs> hard precious metals. 
<clears throat> and if the government were to print too much of it, it'd just be worthless paper. The more of something you have, the, worth, the less each one is worth. And so, you know, if it were me, I would tell the, without the gold standard being restored, I would tell the Federal Reserve banks to print 10% uh, less money next year and start to reduce the amount of money that's in currency. That way, each dollar bill would be worth more than it's currently worth. Because the, the, the scarcity of something causes the value of it to, to be even higher. Your buying power of the dollar would be worth a lot more. But then other countries like Japan, their yen is, based, is valued against the dollar. Our money's worth nothing. Theirs is worth less than nothing. <laughs> Likewise, I think Mexico and other countries. I don't, the way the world economy is, and I'm the last guy to be able to give it any definitive answers on it, it's held together by just the, the, the patience of God, the, the willingness of God to keep it afloat. Politicians have no idea what they're doing. <coughs> just print more money. And there's a, there's a new economic theory now that's saying the government has the federal printing presses, they can print all the money they want, and just make sure everybody in the, in the country has a, a few hundred thousand dollars in their personal account. But if you do that, none of that money's worth anything. There'd be so much of it floating around out there, none of it would be worth anything. Yeah, you might have a, a half a million dollars, each citizen, give a half a million dollars to each citizen. Half a million dollars of worthless money, and um, but then it'll cost you thirty-five dollars for a cup of coffee. At the price of everything, it's almost like wait now at Starbucks. But <laughs> but the but the the value the the price of everything would go up too. And um, but it's only the kindness of God that keeps everything afloat. But even unsaved men say have seen the trends that this can't go on forever. We're going to have total anarchy before much longer if the government doesn't start enforcing its own laws. It's like that, that, that kid that shot 17 people at a school, at high school in Florida. Was it been about three weeks now? Or has it been four weeks? I'm not sure how long now. He's a 19-year-old killer. And I don't care how many years they put him in prison, they could put him in prison for 40 years and after 40 years, say, well, you've, you've paid your debt, you've been a good inmate, let it out. Nobody wants to live next door to him. I don't care how many years he spends in prison. If you let him out, no one's going to want to live next to that guy. Once you take the life of an innocent victim, you forfeit your own life. That's the only way, that, that, and, the, and that kid needs to be put to death now. He needs to be executed now while the crime is still fresh in people's minds. If you let this thing go on two more weeks... It'll have grown cold in the minds of the American people. The news media won't be talking about it any longer. And uh, I guarantee you there'll be another shooting. Yeah. The only way the death penalty sends the appropriate message is if it's executed quickly while the crime is still fresh in people's minds. Amen. That's the only way that people learn the lesson, hey, I don't want to do that. Because I don't want to be... And, and none of this, you know, compassionate... Mercy killing, you know, um, with um, a drug cocktail or a, you know, what do they call it? Lethal injection. Lethal injection, right. Hang them. Hang them in the town square. Hang them out publicly so, and, and require certain people to witness it. Require the news reporters to see it and a video record it. And it would be up to them if they want to air it on television. Funny thing is, uh, Mexico, Mexico would air it. Yeah. <laughs> Funny thing about Mexican television stations, they don't mind airing the gruesome and the gory on their on their network news. Here, American news channels, they have to protect everyone's sensibilities from seeing something. You watch movies all week long, and someone's getting stabbed or murdered, or their head cut off, or their brains blown out, or helicopters bursting into flames, and so forth. And uh, then when it comes to real life, oh, our sensibilities might be offended. Yeah. Are you kidding me? You. <laughs> You have no sensibilities left. There's nothing left, hardly, to the imagination. You know, you wouldn't want someone who's 400 pounds to be hanged publicly. His head might rip off. I know that's gross and grotesque. In his case, he can get the firing squad. That's called lethal injection. What's that? That's also lethal injection. 
Right. <laughs> right. Lethal, a bullet is a lethal injection of sorts. But an only, the only way, and they keep debating gun, you know, gun control, access to guns, uh, restricting gun purchases, raising the age to purchase them, raising, uh, uh, restricting the amount of ammo, all of that is pointless. It's not going to address the problem. The problem is the kid that committed the crime. He's a 19-year-old killer, and he needs to be put to death. And I don't mean 25 years from now. I mean now. And, and they go back and review all those ones in recent years, this Sandy Hook killing with all the children. Find those people, put them to death. Re revive the people's memories of what, uh, of the atrocities that these people committed and say, no more. We're not playing games anymore in this country. But politicians uh, and lawmakers and the courts don't have any good sense. So don't expect those things to happen. And, I mean, the, at least the Muslim hijackers took their own lives with it. Yeah. Darn it. <laughs> it. You know, if they had lived, they'd be sitting in jail for the rest of their lives while the U.S. taxpayer fed them, clothed them. So I'm glad they're dead. Um, but, um, Where was I going with this earlier? Oh, okay, we're talking about, <laughs> we're talking about people prepping. They know the world's coming to apart, coming apart, falling apart at the seams. The uh, wars and rumors of wars are all around. The United Nations hasn't been able to prevent war, although that was their ostensible um, purpose. But they weren't able to uh, prevent war. More wars have broken out since the foundation, the founding of the United Nations, uh, as a as a pattern than uh, were ever breaking out prior to their formation. And so they're worthless. The, economic, the European Union, that didn't bring any stability to the, European, to the European nations that belonged to it. Now England got out of it, and Italy's discussing breaking and getting out of it, and other countries because they want their identity maintained. They don't want to be lost and disappear into some blurry, nebulous uh, uh, mishmash of uh, identity, where their identities are lost. The Bible said, Christ said, nation shall rise against nation. And Brother Young Ha, and I will remember this from um, and Elizabeth too, in Greek class at PBI, uh, the word for nation is ethnos. The Greek word is ethnos. Like from where we get the word ethnicity. And people want their ethnicities preserved and their identities preserved and they don't want to be forced into some big conglomerate uh, where everybody's mixed together. I mean, you break that down even more of a microcosm, uh, southerners and northerners want to stay separate. Brother Ford in Bible school, he said, I don't even think northerners should marry southerners. That's how far he went with the separation act. <laughs> and, um, had to kind of admire his philosophy. He stuck with it. He was consistent, at least. But, uh, but people want their ethnic identities to be preserved, and so they don't want to be forced by some government bureaucracy into some amalgamated uh, hodgepodge of, of countries and identities. Now, back up to um, verse 3 in our text. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him, or the son of man that thou makest account of him? We commented on this idea way back in chapter 8, verse 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Alongside God the Father, the maker of the universe, man is so unimpressive and insignificant that the very idea of God having any desire toward man for communion, for fellowship, and a, and a relationship with man is very perplexed, hard to, hard to wrap your mind around. And yet he does. And yet he wants to have fellowship with men and women. And he made a way for that to take place by the Lord Jesus Christ suffering on behalf of them for the sake of their sins. 
I'm so glad he suffered from my sin. But you know, when you, you and I stop, uh, if we were to stop and think about it, my dad touched on this in his sermon, that God would, would care enough about you, or care enough about me, that he would set the events in motion so that somewhere along the way you would hear the gospel, someone could witness to you or talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. It might have been your parents when you were young. It might have been some friend that cared about you enough to talk to you. And then uh, conviction to come upon you and then the decision that you needed to make and you would make it and salvation was yours and fellowship with God could now be restored once again your sin no longer uh, separating between you and your God the thing that God would care enough about me to let me get saved as a little boy six years old because he wanted a uh, fellowship with me someday in eternity. Now, there are a lot of people who see the gospel coming their way and they walk the other direction. You don't even get a chance to talk to them. And I've mentioned this before, when, when uh, we pass out a tract to someone on the sidewalk and they, you see them walk away and just throw it on the ground, they're not afraid of what might be in it. They know what's in it. They already know what's in it. And so by the, the hardness of their own hearts, they are putting off their salvation. They're putting it off, putting it off. And if God's word is true and he says, my spirit shall not always strive with man, there's going to come a time when someone won't be there to witness to them anymore. They've turned a deaf ear to it. They've said no so many times that God's all right, fine. I'll move on to somebody else that will, that will hear, that will respond. I'll give someone else a chance. You've had enough chances. And um, I'm just so very grateful that God cared enough about me to let me get saved when I was a young boy. But that, that God would be mindful of man. When you think of how, what an infinitesimal speck man is in the universe and in the creation, that God wants to have fellowship with you and with me. And verse 4 it says, man is like to vanity. His days are as a shadow that passeth away. Just as James 4.14 4 asked, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Uh, the name, you know the name Abel, whose works were righteous and his brother's canes were evil, a means temporary or transitory, passing so the physical life, even of a righteous man, is only temporary. These bodies are not made to last forever. They need to be changed. They need to be improved by God. And that he would love us enough to promise to do that someday is another blessing we, we often take for granted. We assume it's ours as Christians. We don't pause to meditate on it and think about what a wonderful promise it is. But that man whose life is so brief, alongside eternity, Billy Graham, 99 years old, or anyone else uh, over 100 years old, that's nothing. Alongside eternity. And uh, but that God would be interested in you and care enough about you to send someone with the gospel to you or some way that you could hear it or read it or have it presented to you, and then the decision to trust Jesus Christ was now in your lap. And it was up to you to say yes to Jesus Christ. I understand. I'm a sinner. And um, I will give Billy Graham this much credit. He kept the, for most of his years of ministry, he kept the, the essence of the gospel as simple as, as he could keep it. Amen. You know, there are a lot of things we could dispute with about Billy Graham and his careers and his choices and decisions and his associations. 
And that's a, another subject. But he kept the presentation of the gospel simple enough that if a man admits he's a sinner and understands that Christ came and died for sinners, he was judged on, the, on behalf of the sinner. So that on that basis alone, you can ask for God's mercy and the righteousness of Christ then becomes yours and a great spiritual transaction can take place and you uh, are born again. He kept it very simple. And so thank the Lord for that. But, um, yeah, let's see, we got down to verse, we read as far as verse 8. Whose mouth speaketh vanity, and their right hand is a right hand of falsehood. We'll stop right there.